Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for being with us today. We are broadcasting live from, uh, I'm, I'm traveling a little bit in Florida, Ormond Beach, Flagler Beach. Some of you might know it on the East Coast, and New York City, where Betty is. So a uh, little standard uh, housekeeping for Zoom. While we can't see or hear you, we are uh, encouraging and welcome any questions in the chat box or the Q&A. Please feel free to ask anything. We have a lot of people that are coming on today, but we'll get to as many as possible. Um, and all questions are welcome, so don't be shy. We are, for the record, recording this. And so if you care to share it after we post it on the Family Office Insights YouTube channel uh, and share it with somebody that would benefit from hearing Betty today and what we talk about, that would be super cool and welcome and so it'll take a couple of days but it'll be up there and of course uh as usual we make sure that we put you in direct touch with uh, betty and hearts and minds um uh, post webinar so again uh we're recording this and you you're welcome to look at it once we post it on the uh, family office insights youtube channel and and welcome all questions so uh thank you for uh, spending uh, a little bit of time with us today. Uh, it's a beautiful day in New York and it's a beautiful day in Florida and wherever you are, I hope you're enjoying it as well. And with that, please welcome Betty. Betty, thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Art, for having me and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I want to start by telling you a bit about who I am and why I came to create Hearts and Minds. Um, I have a long career in media I was the founding president of Cartoon Network and presided over its first nine years of growth. Uh, I should mention that Cartoon Network grew from Ted Turner's $320 million purchase of Hanna-Barbera Cartoon Studio and has grew to be a $3 billion global brand. We created our studio and among the shows that I greenlit was, and this is relevant to the current venture, uh, the iconic girl power hit, Powerpuff Girls. Um, later, I served as CEO of Lifetime I refreshed a brand that was skewing older and downscale by green lighting, in that case, movies and dramatic series that also depicted more empowered women than before. Throughout my career, I must say, I've always believed that entertainment has enormous power of positive influence in order to create a more civilized society. Now, this takes having, raising civilized citizens, which means that entertainment media has enormous power, I think, to influence um, and the problem is, though, that that influence often goes unused by the industry I'm in. So recently, as a consultant, I, I came to know more about this burgeoning field of social and emotional learning. And SEL teaches people, if you've heard about it from your kids or schools, it teaches empathy, self-advocacy, conflict resolution, and confidence building life skills. Given the rising public alarm about the uh, an epidemic of depression and anxiety among teen girls, an SEL embedded entertainment uh, property and uh, company would be particularly compelling right now and therefore valuable. But the industry, actually my in entertainment industry has yet to catch the wave, which is the opportunity for me. There's a gap in the media marketplace and that's why I founded Hearts and Minds. It is a new media brand that will provide pioneering entertainment to empower people of all ages, ultimately. I'm just getting started first with our teen girls. It will also be a great business. In fact, as I think about it, it could be the most valuable company I build in my career. And the time to get started is now. I'd like to just show, uh, start with, since I, I am an entertainment executive, we're gonna start with a video that conveys the energy of Hearts and Minds, our new media brand. So that gives you the flavor of our high energy brand, even though we are very much dealing with some serious topics. Exactly what kind of company is Hearts and Minds? Well, uh, to break it down, and we'll get more into each of these throughout this presentation, but it is a new media brand. It will form, first and foremost produce and distribute entertainment that blends social emotional learning into interactive storytelling to empower girls for life. We will draw our, our stories from the whole world of all the things girls care about most. And uh, we will be distributing this entertainment initially on a multiplicity of platforms from day one, including Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, 
and wherever girls are going to be in the years ahead. TikTok has, was born and has already taken off just in the time I've been developing Hearts and Minds, so who knows where they'll be next, but we will be there. To, eventually, as the, uh, the ideas that succeed in the social uh, uh, platforms will be harvested, the best ones will be developed into longer form programming for major networks and streaming services. But do not make the mistake of thinking we are purely a production entity or a studio. Our content and the ways we market and distribute it will engage a massive multi-platform following that is aspirational, diverse, and therefore very valuable to mission-aligned sponsors who have very few options for reaching girls in socially positive viewing environments that make the brands look good. Ultimately, we're building a content-driven community. That's what this is all about right here. People go, what is a content-driven community? A girl power movement in which millions of girls will find our highly resonant life skill building stories and be invited to respond to, share, and even build upon them so they can actually feel connected to each other and to, our, and to us by a sense of belonging and self-confidence. I want to drill down because I said it in passing, but this is, uh, the actual frightening problem that drove me to start this camp, this company. Our girls, if you haven't already seen this in different news stories recently, our girls are suffering at alarming rates of, and it's, this is beyond normal tween or a teenage girl angst, which a lot of people go, aren't they always you know, dramatic? But this is not dramatic. This is anxiety and depression at alarming rates. And parents, school psychologists, and mental health specialists have known about this. It was sort of bubbling up um, in research uh, probably around 2017 or so, but it's in the news a lot now, partially because it's being exacerbated by the pandemic. This problem is especially serious when we focus, the reason I'm focusing on tween girls is it's upstream problem solving. The, the tween years, the middle school years, second only to early childhood, are actually the one, the life stage that can most define how our girls fare as grown up women. So while there's a lot of debate and uncertainty, we can get into all sorts of topics and now add the pandemic to the list of potential reasons for this depression and anxiety, there's might be uncertainty to be about, about which of these things you know, causes it the most, but I can tell you there's one thing that is completely certain, and that is that these girls are not giving up their phones ever. So all the more reason why it's time to create um, a company like Hearts and Minds. This slide uh, for uh, summarizes most of the key points. Um, I want to uh, talk a, a little bit more in a, in a few slides about this notion of the blend. And the blend starts with engaging girls with authentic stories from inside their social and emotional world and using interactive experiential learning to be woven into our content. And I'll give you a little bit more about that. Um, we already know it's plat platform agnostic, and I want to stress again that we are building both an aspirational audience for mission-aligned sponsors and a sense of empowerment and belonging for today's girls. Why, or I would say what, are the benefits of starting a media company for imparting social emotional learning and emotional intelligence on social media of all places? Well, first of all, starting out on multiple social platforms lays the foundation for delivering a media intervention at scale. Girls are not just suffering from in, in their schools where, where SEL is currently taught. Uh, and we can't assume that all the girls who need it are living in school districts or parts of our country uh, where great SEL curricula is available or the principal is driving home the importance through it in the entire culture of a school. There are suffering in some states and not others. And so many relationships also, uh, so many relationship issues are not just taking place among students and teachers. The, the critical things are often happening at home with parents and uh, relationships with parents or siblings or their friend community. And also it's no secret that we as humans are kind of hardwired to learn important stuff through stories that resonate at an emotional level. And speaking of resonance, another benefit of our solution is that we provide a trusted resonant voice that, uh, that um, actually sponsors advocacy groups, even parents have a hard time when they're trying to con communicate with their tweens without sounding preachy. Having a, a, a sort of trusted voice from somewhere else in the world 
makes sense at a certain level since developmentally, as many of you know, as parents of middle schoolers, part of being a middle schooler or a tween is part of the work of it developmentally is to be separating from your parents. So we provide this voice um, from somewhere else in the world. Um, the other uh, benefits of starting on social media have a lot to do with data. I come from being a traditional executive who had to like wait for Nielsen ratings back in the day. And for me, social media and for all of us generates immediate data about what's working and it's what's not. And that could be anything from stories to which SEL themes are the girls most um, uh, concerned with. This immediate feedback, of course, also gives me and will be giving any of you who are early investors some tangible success metrics in this early seed round. By the end, we want to know more about who are if we're reaching our target audience and which of our initial shows do best, and also that they perform well uh, as uh, social impact entertainment uh, to help us raise our next round of investment and also initial brand integration deals with sponsor brands. Another big benefit of our solution, uh, and you can go to our website and take a look, but we have an incredible team. Uh, I am building it. It is a multidisciplinary company to begin with, from creators um, and, and social media mavens to the experts in SEL and in adolescent child development, modeled somewhat on how Sesame Street was created 50 years ago. That show is what it is because it didn't just have Jim Henson and it didn't just have leaders in early childhood uh, and how people learn to read. Those people work very closely together and collaboratively, and I'm going to create that sort of initial development team and keep that uh, um, as a sort of workshop way of developing all of our initial content and for years to come. Why is this a really good idea to be doing right now? What's the market opportunity of the moment? As I've already mentioned, uh, tween anxiety has been exacerbated by uh, social distancing the, at a very time when uh, particularly middle schoolers are supposed to be learning social development. Um, aside from all the feeling maybe behind in the schoolwork, this was really uh, you know, detrimental to their development. Um, but even before the pandemic, I have to say that the tween girl market um, was and still is in a very important uh, opportunity. In fact, it's, it constitutes a hundred billion dollars in buying power, 25 billion of that spent by girls themselves from their allowances, gifts, maybe babysitting, and the other 75 billion uh, is uh, the amount of money and family purchases that they influence every year. Brands themselves spend another 25 billion in the US alone just to reach tween girls. Another uh, sort of wind behind my sales right now is that just in the time that it's taken me to develop hearts and minds, SEL has become increasingly mainstream and a big industry on its own among educators. Um, districts are projected, uh, the different projections from different trades are showing anything from 21 to 40, almost $47 billion spent per school year on SEL curriculum products. But even the school, the educators, the people I've consulted for in that world, everybody uh, acknowledges that there's a desperate need for this kind of learning assistance to reach girls, not just in school, but at home in the full experience of their daily lives. And yet the entertainment world has not yet caught, uh, caught this wave. So it's time for a dedicated brand to drive home this learning into the entire tween girl experience, whether on screens and off. But one of the biggest opportunities for hearts and minds right now Whoops, sorry. I'm getting something. Sorry. Yep, here we are. Um, the biggest opportunity uh, is that we can own the space. There have been hits that have been made by a number of these companies on the left hand side. Disney Channel had Andy Mack, Netflix, is around, we saw a scene from around your block, our block. Um, so it's not that, that they haven't discovered um, how SEL themes tend to do well in entertainment, but they're simply not in a position to focus on this as they're the one and only thing they do. We are the only ones who are, are able to be focused on it. And so essentially uh, a lot of these companies uh, are not so much uh, competitors, but in some cases, validators of our success and also future potential buyers when we want to harvest our hits into longer form. 
I've been talking a lot now about this blended entertainment. What do we mean by blended entertainment? Um, and uh, here's what we're talking about. Again, we start with that multidisciplinary team, but the people on my team and I uh, have spent a lot of time on how do you deftly leverage aspects of both traditional and interactive storytelling, like the, the thing you saw in the, the video. Um, what are, why do I think video and storytelling and, and um, uh, narrative entertainment and also at some point games, and I'll get to that too. Why do I think they're really useful for teaching SEL skills? Well, here are just three of the many uh, reasons. There's of course modeling behavior. That one always seems to be obvious to people. How do those I admire handle different situations? There's also branching narratives. And branching narratives are coming over from the game world more and more into also narrative entertainment, sometimes loosely referred to as choose your own adventure shows. But for teaching SEL skills, whether on YouTube or on Instagram, they can also help our tween viewers safely explore and virtually experience the consequences of various story path decisions without experiencing the danger or the discomfort of having made mistakes. I also have to say that for tweens, even a realization that they have choices, that a character and therefore they have maybe several ways they could handle something, that is a significant source of what SEL types would call a healthier mindset. And character point of view is also right out of the world of storytelling itself. How do I have empathy for those who might not share my own views? Um, in, this, in this case, how is my boyfriend viewing differently the exact same experiences we're having together in this particular um, video? Uh, to get uh, even more detailed, this actual uh, slide refers to what you saw uh, at the end of that uh, video I just showed you. We've nicknamed the show party perspective, but it's actually one approach would be to produce Instagram and YouTube dramas told from multiple character perspectives. So our audience would have to check out each of their Instagram stories to find out what happened from each character's point of view. Um, the actual ongoing story of like what we decide the actual show will, will um, be about or which actions we will listen to or you know should I stay or should I leave, um, they'll be able to follow that on another account or on longer form YouTube and IGTV videos. But the thing is that they are, uh, we, I call this organic delivery because in order to follow the storyline and actually engage with the show's characters, they're gonna actually experience firsthand how different people come with different perspectives to any situation. The other interesting thing about the show that's helpful is that they will also experience just simply what it means to take a beat, to stop and consider various reasons for why someone is treating them the way they are. And that that leads to the difference between responding and reacting. And again, those of you who are parents of teenagers know that reacting is pretty much what the teenage brain tends to do by default. So even the notion that there's choice and having people choose things is actually part of the learning. But we don't wanna always have to do shows that are as cutting edge um, and potentially a little more elaborate than as Party Perspective was. We also want to be able to bring our SEL lens to more traditional um, story forms, such as just the personal testimonial celebrity story interview. Then we did that as a proof of concept. We called it high anxiety. And the good news about high anxiety is I just want to know if we could get people to watch. And, and also I know that engagement, which is not just reach, but like how much people stayed with us just out of the blue. We did not, we were not an ad council campaign. We were just launching out of nowhere. And within our first few days and weeks on on uh, Instagram and YouTube, most of our engagement and all of it, a lot of the viewing ended up on Instagram, another data-driven thing that we were able to learn in the first 24 hours. 10% um, engagement on Instagram is actually three times uh, what is normally considered pretty great. Usually you're getting maybe three and three and a half, uh, you know, is, is really a good story and we had 10%. Um, as you can see, if you, if you are able to read through, we highlighted some of the comments, these were, um, screen grabs pulled uh, by our uh, SEL trained community managers. And I want to say that with hearts and minds, but not just what we make, but the care we take with community management and the environment we create on our accounts is a big part of the brand product and the brand promise. So by using those community managers, I was able to, and, and that was able, that helped generate this 10% engagement and engagement will translate 
into a Mission Alliance sponsor uh, saying, wow, you know, even in your early years as we're building our reach, the engagement is impressive. Um, and we also learned from this when you read through these screen, brag, uh, screen grabs that this is one of the other parts of this experiment is I just want to know, is it possible somewhere in social media, if you take the right care about what you make and how you're handling its exhibition, can you create a safe and supportive oasis on social media of all places? And the answer is yes. Betty? Yes. May I ask a question real quick? Sure. Uh, can you jump back to that prior page? Mm -hmm. I know that no one's really in your space, so to the extent that you can answer this, and if you can't, it's fine. How would you say that 10% compares to anything that is close? Is that way above expectation, about in the mean? Um, yes, definitely uh, for this kind of um, uh, pr uh, product or pr you know presentation, it is. Um, we we were trying to follow other things like uh, you know uh, it's interesting I don't believe that I'm trying to think of a, a comparable campaign I I didn't have access to some of the engagement numbers I had only the viewing numbers and we were outperforming on YouTube and on Instagram uh, some of the uh, mental health campaigns that ad that for example Ad Council was doing. Uh, a few months ahead of us when we did heart, uh, high anxiety. And I think part of it was because we were, it's a, it might be apples to oranges and that if uh, a campaign is mostly on YouTube, which is less of an engagement medium than Instagram, you know, um, we, we did better on both engagement and um, uh, on reach uh, until we did as well in the first two weeks and better than it took uh, that other campaign over not only a couple of months, but with all the this ad support that an ad council campaign generally has brings with it. So I, I, you know, I, I don't have an exact like, oh, there was something no, else. That's just a good, like yeah, just, yeah. Just and and for all the, so, for all the social media people that I had working on this, they were blown away by the 10% because they have worked on other projects, things that were promoting movies or, you know, some of their bread and butter work was to do social media to get, to get people interested in things besides um, a kind of, uh, you know, light, but still serious celebrity interview. And uh, they were blown away because it usually uh, is hard to get that amount of engagement on something that I also forgot to mention and a key point, thank you for reminding me, I spent $1,000 out of my pocket on this experiment for marketing, $1,000. And, um, and we were what able to get- What a bargain. What? What a bargain. <laughs> What a bargain. I, I actually, and I, I can't promise that I'm always going to have, you know, A-list celebrity for everything we do. They did this um, as a, uh, a pro bono effort because of the cause. Um, so, but I can tell you that, Lana, I can tell you this is the world of media we're in right now. We thought we did a promotion between Vogue to link to our YouTube videos for this. And found that the viewing on YouTube was nowhere near the viewing of Insta on Instagram. And I think it has to do with the fact that while Teen Vogue has 1.5 million followers on Instagram, Lana Condor by herself has 7 million. So when people talk about influencers or about people who matter, um, that's like, you know, exhibit A, right? <laughs> so some of, some of this engagement could have been the celebrity, some of it could have been how great my social media people were uh, at being super nimble. Um, my media buyer said, okay, you only have a thousand dollars. You're not getting much traction on YouTube, but you're getting a lot on Instagram. Let's do all your buying on Instagram and put metal pedal to the metal. So, you know, some of it was just good judgment about having a good team around me. Um, but that's kind of how I build things. Yep. Perfect. That that's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Carry on. Um, and speaking of, you know, what I'm actually known for. Um, a lot of people were wondering, how are we going to market this? Because it's not always easy to get attention in a crowded um, world for all that's out there on social media and the streaming services. But for me, I come from, uh, number one, I am focused on engagement because absolutely we're going to need reach. But in the early days, uh, it, it means a lot more to sponsors, whether they're commercial sponsors or even sort of the public interest world or anyone else who wants to do business with us or, or reach our audience. Engagement is extremely important because it means there's so much casual people flying through, on, especially on social media, 
that uh, the number of people you're reaching, while it's always great to say you hit, you reach millions and millions of people, it's the engagement measure that really is going to ultimately matter. And I'm used to that because I've had to build fan bases for things like Cartoon Network when there was Nickelodeon, Disney, Fox, plenty of competition in the marketplace. I know that from running particularly cable networks, I feel have a lot in common with building digital content brands because we have in common that we tend to have to engage fairly specific target audiences. And we're both creating and curating content that's always on 24 seven with a trusted brand voice that's resonant and that meets expectations of the target. And that will be true as true of hearts and minds, different audience, different voice than with Cartoon Network and other things that I have led and built. Um, this trusted voice is really a precious asset because it requires understanding that this is the cool part. Um, content is actually your marketing when you're building a media brand because your shows are probably the best expression of what it is you stand for. But also, especially with the world of social media, marketing creates content. Whether you know if you are engaging with the audience, if you are doing the right types of promotions, and you know things where we want to know whether they're learning a social emotional learning lessons, that could be a challenge on TikTok for them to show us what else, uh, well, how else they might have handled something. It could be all sorts of things that are either generating you um, user generated content, uh, comments, um, reposts. Uh, so actually, our marketing is going to uh, always try and draw our audience in, and then our our um, our content is, uh, becomes, in many ways, our marketing and marketing our content. Now everyone's at this point, I'm sure wondering, so how does this thing make money anyway? And I want to say that while we will initially monetize our content via various types of advertiser support, our business model is designed to build multiple sizable other revenue streams over time so that we're not overly dependent on any one particular kind. So we will start by creating in our first uh, with our seed money, a batch of short form hearts and minds branded content blending the uh, SEL into the entertainment marketed and distributed across various social video platforms. Um, and then that to in order to engage our first uh, tween following. And then we also plan to launch with a website. I mentioned this not because it's an exhibition venue. Most girls are not going to watch content on a website these days, but more as a brand headquarters. It'll be like air traffic control, uh, directing girls what to watch where, what's going on where, is there some way to enter a contest? Is there some way to uh, meet other, um, you know, find out what shows are attracting more of the um, the girls who are entrepreneurs or the ones who are the uh, yoga fans, all sorts of stuff can happen on the website. Um, it also serves as a safe place for our followers from all platforms to be directed to the website to safely provide their contact information, whether it's uh, texting or, or email as opt-in membership community. Um, and it's also a website that can also uh, require parents to, to approve this if the girl is um, not 13. Um, the, and the, this this uh, sort of direct audience uh, membership thing, starting from the earliest days of focus on CRM, um, is going to be important to us, as you'll see in a moment, with some of our other revenue streams. So we're going to start out with brand integration sponsorships, because those are the sort of deals where, while the sponsor does want to see some reach, they're most in, interested in, in engagement and trying to get involved with somebody early. Um, and also get that sort of halo effect I was talking about before as being on the side of girl power. You see on this slide, these are just a few of the many brands that we're uh, staying on top of as being in our wheelhouse because they are, even CoverGirl has switched from easy, breezy, beautiful to I am what I make up, which is a form of self-determination and self-expression. Um, from there, as we get more reach, we'll be getting into the more traditional ad sales. And then actually, as we grow that opt-in direct membership I spoke of a, a moment ago, uh, we are gonna spend the first few years experimenting. There's whole cottage industry to help different companies figure out what are the sort of experiences and you test out what are the things that our girls might pay extra for. And in this case, we're not assuming a lot of extra because they're not big breadwinners themselves, but we do uh, plan to grow um, a, a membership revenue and offer things 
uh, that um, uh, that they would pay extra for, but I will always keep the mass version going because I really don't, people are saying, are you gonna suddenly become a subscription company? And no, this would be more another revenue stream. I actually do feel that as an impact oriented business, I want to always be available and have the majority of our things be available to everyone, even those who are not paying extra. Um, unique insight about this demographic, we do not plan to be a, a particularly data oriented company. And in fact, we are going to never share the actual private data uh, of girls, but there's a lot of aggregated insight that we're going to have by virtue of the fact that our shows are so deeply relevant to the things that girls are concerned about and care about. Um, and so whether we end up monetizing the data per se, I can tell you that it's going to be valuable and practically table stakes for closing some of the brand integration and uh, ad sales deals because it's the sponsors who are going to want to know like exactly how engaged are they with us and what forms does it take and how is it that we know more than they do about, about um, the, the world of tween girls. Um, producer and format fees are the things you get when you start licensing or selling your uh, long form shows to the likes of streamers or networks. Um, we're not planning to do a ton of that right away because we have to create a track record. So those come in in our third year um, with only one series and then maybe another one getting sold a second year. Um, those things can take a while but we do uh, to sell, but once we're doing it, they can be quite lucrative and they also give us a much bigger sort of brand footprint. Um, licensing will come whether we have a viral hit or we become a, a thing as just hearts and minds. More likely it'll be driven by shows, characters, both in social and as we get into longer form programming um, and have some hits under our belt. Um, it's going to take a lot of talent and experience to build a company as fi both financially successful and impactful as hearts and minds. Um, uh, all of these bios are on our website, and I think they're listed in, in arts uh, information about us. But it combines uh, an array of talent and expertise across all the disciplines that are going to matter for our success entertainment brand building executives like myself, but also visionary creatives, social media mavens, startup finance executives, um, and uh, experts in SEL adolescent development and how to blend learning into stories and games. And we're just getting started. I want you to see everybody. Um, so how are we gonna get all of this done? Um, the financing I'm looking to raise is a million dollars or early seed round. Um, the bulk of it will be spent on uh, buying out the rights of a team of people's ideas so we can brainstorm openly um, and create um, at least 10 concepts uh, from the blended expertise of my team. We'll probably do some testing that will uh, definitely want to narrow that 10 down to three to four short one series. And we will be, we don't have to, we will can do focus groups, but we have the world of social media to test them in the real world. And that's what I um, plan to do. Uh, we will then uh, use that. We also are going to spend more than my thousand dollars <laughs> as, as, as wonderful that as that was for that one thing. Uh, if you're going to test something and try and figure out what is the high end potential for this kind of blended content, we do plan to spend money on marketing. Um, and uh, the goal of this round is to accelerate the raise of a, a larger round by being able to show all of our early investors and some of the brands that we're going to start meeting with once we have a slate and some of this content early insight on both on the promise of meaningful engaged audience traction. We're always thinking ahead. Art has found that I'm quite the planner. <laughs> I can't help myself. But we're, uh, we're, we want you to know uh, a little bit about our go-to-market strategy in the first four years of our company. Um, and it's a lot about how you know, we want to be able to deliver metrics to you in the, by the end of, you know, before the end of year one. So year one is, as I've mentioned, launching a website, creating our first three to four series, depends on how, how, we, how many you can squeeze out in terms of lower social media budgets. Um, we're, not trying to or we're not projecting meaningful revenue because it's going to take most of the first year to develop, air these, collect our data, and start meetings with uh, brand partners. Um, and those initial uh, brand integration deals, even for companies that have been around a while, they can take a while to hammer out. 
And so uh, just from a timing standpoint and a focus standpoint, um, we are not going to project, we're not gonna have meaningful revenue in year one, but by year two, A, we'll be adding more content because you have to have more content for sponsors to show up around. Um, we will have time to close those deals um, and we will be bringing in a you know, modest revenue in that year of 430,000 because some of the initial deals will not be large. They'll be sort of like a way of testing the waters with us. But by year three, a bunch of things start to happen at once. You see a, a, a big ramp up in content. Um, there will be also um, much bigger uh, deals if we've been successful and people have been happy with our performance in year two. And then very importantly, in year three, we have not one, but two new revenue streams in addition to ad revenue and sponsorship revenue. One being some of the early producer fees from having sold a series uh, to a streamer or network at some point in year three, and also launching our premium paid membership program. Uh, and then by year four, the revenue is 10 million 320. We actually will be EBITDA profitable by only about $2 million. And the thing that I, I like most about our revenue in year four is that it's um, half sponsorship and half from the growth of some of these other, um, the paid community selling long, another long form series. And what's not pictured here um, is the beginning of a small amount of um, consumer licensing from something in all of this uh, becoming you know enough of a, pop culture thing that licensing starts to come into play, but not until year four. What am I thinking about beyond the, the fourth year? What is the long-term growth of Hearts and Minds? It's not just a tween girl company. I feel that uh, the world of emotional intelligence, it, just from all the meetings I've taken while putting this together, there are people who are teaching it to girls. There are people who are teaching it to boys. There are people who are teaching it to grownups who are having to manage people for the first time in their lives. And there's certainly a lot of parents right now who um, would love more on how they can deal with the kids, the stresses of their lives, you name it. This is not a social emotional learning does not stop at middle school. It's just one of many developmental stages. So um, there's a lot of, uh, I'm speaking to the third bullet point first, but the ability to target and add new demos uh, after we nail it with the tween girls um, is definitely in our plans. In fact, some of it we're going to be monitoring in the first four years anyway, since unlike school where there's first grade, second grade, third grade, everything's strictly scaffolded. In the world of consumer media, by targeting older tweens, we'll probably also be getting younger teens. Um, and also parents, the tween girls um, are not yet running away from their parents. So there could be some co-viewing with mom and dad. Um, but in order to focus more on teen boys and tween boys, we'll probably want to add and need to add a game element to this uh, game development and not pure narrative entertainment. Um, and so that becomes a whole other um, effort and in the interest of entrepreneurial focus, I, I'm leaving a tween boys, uh, not they, they, we're going to make our shows inclusive of them. Certainly the girls are going to have to deal with SEL around how they deal with boys and brothers um, and uh, friends. Uh, so um, it's not like we'll be ignoring boys, but in terms of really going pedal to the metal with them, we'll have to be at a point when we can introduce games. But since we're dealing with branching narratives from the beginning, uh, there'll be some uh, you know, maybe a uh, smooth transition. International expansion, I feel confident about precisely because we ran high anxiety and we'll be running all our things on social media platforms that do have global uh, followings. And because I did a media buy, even the smallest one for high anxiety, we got to learn from Instagram how much viewing we were getting and a strong amount. It's also showed up in our community management and the community managers were staying around the night and we're seeing different time zones coming in to comment and and, and talk about and, and, and wishing they uh, you know, wanted to let Lana Condor know how much they liked her breathing exercise. But we were seeing a lot and uh, coming out of uh, South Asia, um, UK, Australia, New Zealand, Canada. So the, the need for this, the, the fact that there's a, a tween and teenage um, anxiety, it might be that anxiety and depression expresses itself differently in different parts of the world, but the need for emotional intelligence seems to be an international uh, proposition. Um, and as far as a branded content agency goes, that probably will be almost a natural outgrowth of all the work we have to do to service um, our, our growing amount and size 
of uh, brand content, uh, branded um, integration deals um, in the same way that, um, you know, people would want to come to cartoon, once we got the Cartoon Network voice down or once MTV or once Spice Media, when people get a certain voice and they get known for being a great pathway to a particular uh, demographic, sponsors tend to want you to become an agency because they want you to sort of help them have that Cartoon Network thing or that hearts and minds feel. So I think branded content agency is almost naturally in our future. I have to say that um, our diff, I don't need to probably tell you this if you're watching the news at all ever lately, but our difficult and divided world could definitely use a lot more emotional intelligence right now. So whether you're a tween girl navigating the social and emotional challenges of growing up right now, or whether you're a grown up worried about how to deal with the kid you love, I hope you'll join us at the very beginning to help us break new ground in terms of media and creativity and innovation of the blend of media and learning. Break new ground and deliver pioneering solutions through entertainment's powerful potential to engage the hearts and minds of audiences everywhere. I look forward to working with you to building a pioneering company that will do, I hope you can see by now, extremely well by doing good. Welcome to Hearts and Minds, and thank you, Arthur. Oh, you're so welcome. Betty, that was just extraordinary. Beautifully done. So among the many, many questions, there are uh, more about how do they, how do people send you money? So we'll make sure we get that squared away. Um, yeah, don't lose those questions. <laughs> um, no, there were many people that, that, uh, just right away said, okay, how do we do this? Um, uh, uh, can we can we field a few questions before we uh, move uh, close up? Absolutely, please do. Uh, so you referenced the wild success of Sesame Street and how that part of what you're doing is modeled after their method of success. Can you talk a little bit more about what that means? Yes, well, I um, I was always, I have to say this interest in edutainment for me goes back to all the way to my high school like thesis paper. I had to write on, you know, how you have to write, do one thing for the first time that back then didn't involve encyclopedia or today would not involve Google. We have to do primary research. And I was so fascinated when I first saw Sesame Street and Electric Company in my high school. I was already in high school, so I didn't need to learn how to read, but I really wanted to learn how they could do something that was so great and yet so useful. And Sesame actually was a, a media intervention at scale themselves. Uh, and, you know, in the way that people are greatly fearful about social media right now, people were greatly fearful about television, the great wasteland that was going to fry our kids' brains if we spent too much time in front of the TV set. And yet they went right into it and saw its value for reaching all sorts of people who maybe they're, they're pre this was early childhood, it wasn't teens, and it was literacy and numeracy instead of SEL, but, and they actually had some SEL, at least uh, Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers did too, but as I, I got to talk to both in high school and then in my professional life at running Cartoon Network, I've met a lot of people who were there from the beginning. And uh, the key was that they, um, as I said, uh, I asked how, I, I sometimes find that media, exec, uh, media and creative sort of roll their eyes when they're dealing with, with people who they think are academics or doctors or things like that. And I said, how did you do that? And what they did was they chose carefully, you know, they chose somebody as brilliant. They didn't just have like, this is not, Hearts and Minds is not going to be relying on user generated content. That will be sort of our marketing and a way of building community. But we do wanna, we are working with, you know, the professional types. Um, who know how to tell a good story and, and who know, you know, how to um, frame things out and work with new technology and um, who are willing to experiment, uh, as I'm sure there was a lot of at the beginning of Sesame Street. But the cool thing that people told me about Jim Henson was that he was not, he was always embracing of the uh, psych, uh, early childhood development people and the how do people learn to read people because he was like, wow, like I can do my thing as an entertainer and teach people to read. That is awesome. And likewise, the people who were on the other side were hand chosen, not only for their expertise and subject matter, but because they didn't think they were producers, that they wanted to work and they've always wanted to and valued the ability for entertainment to, um, uh, you know, help teach. Uh, in the case of Sesame Street, it was millions of kids. Initially, it was sort of 
born at the time of Head Start. You know, it was really meant to be an intervention for lower income kids whose families were not reading to them. And uh, it was, you know, in the period of Head Start. Remember Head Start getting started? Yeah, of course. So, yeah. so, um, so it started like that. But, you know, when you create something great, everybody wants to watch it, you know. Um, and I think that um, that's my view of how I want to start Hearts and Minds with some of the greatest minds who really, um, I'm finding the uh, the SEL people are a joy to talk to because uh, the ones who I know are right for us are the ones who's like, God, I've always wanted to do this. Or some of them are already working on games in um, university labs where they're trying to figure out how to teach, how to deconstruct different emotional sciences and get them into story into game uh, storified games. Uh, so um, I think that the um, the raw materials are there. They're just kind of waiting to be harnessed like they were 50 years ago. Um, Sesame did get started as a non-for-profit, um, but they were so successful. I know that at some point they had to really figure out what to do with all the licensing revenue from all the, <laughs> the, the, the Muppets and the Puppets. Um, and I just feel, I did think of this as a not-for-profit, but I just feel that um, there's just a lot of value in what we're creating. And I know that there is um, a desire, particularly now um, in the heels of Me Too and in the concern about you know, um, empathy and uh, crossing so many bizarre divides right now and divisiveness. And yet we're raising a generation of kids who are actually more multicultural and more probably open than we ever were. And so um, I, I feel like there's a lot of uh, people who are going to want to reach our girls initially. Um, and, um, but they're, as I say, they, they're going to have to be mission aligned in what they do. Otherwise they wouldn't find us as, you know, why would they be bothering with us? Yeah. Uh, and I think we're going to magnetize a lot. And also, um, what I'm also starting to notice is it's not just what we call traditional teenage girl brands. There's other like more corporate things, whether it's financial institutions or, um, I was noticing that CVS, like I wouldn't normally go to drugstores for, you know, but CVS has its own. Um, commitment to women with what's called the CVS watermark, uh, where they have now promised that every time that, you know, they have their own pro brand products and they've made a commitment to always label if a woman's been touched up or some photo's been, you know, manipulated in some way in their advertising. So um, I just think that, you know, the, the time is right. Um, and uh, I have to say the pandemic is really, I can't express how much worse um, the teen and tween anxiety is. Um, there have been a lot of newspaper articles about it just in the last few weeks. Even the joy of maybe being able to go back to school. Uh, I saw in the New York Times recently, these middle school girls are afraid to go back already because they're body shaming because they gained weight or they developed during the pandemic when nobody was seeing them. And like, what a, that's crushing when you think of like how much it, it might be kind of great to be able to see your friends again. So, um, so what's that? What do they call that body dysmorphia? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And body shaming, you know, they might, yeah, whether they've gained weight or not, they feel badly about it. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just so, more feeling the right word. So Eddie, I don't know if that answered your Sesame Street yep. question, but. Um, it totally did. And then some. Thank you. Okay. Um, there's a question and maybe a suggestion in uh, in one. Uh -huh. uh, would it not be worth to, uh, considering how games could be beneficial to girls? About half of all video game players are girls. So, uh, Gabby, yes, yes that uh, yeah, she no, I think incorporating it uh, until you incorporate boys may be counterproductive. Yeah, it might be late. And also we're going to play, well, we, I am aware of girls in gaming and we actually are trying to talk about, even with our narrative entertainment or some of these multiple, you know, there's different ways of executing branching narratives, but some of the things might actually feel game-like, you know, even in the early stages. Um, girls are big, uh, big of that. I just, um, it's you, uh, I, it's really just out of focus. It's like, uh, if I can get to it sooner than later, I would. And I also think that, as I mentioned, some of the SEL experts on my team are already dealing with games. And so if we can figure out maybe how to, you know, I'm dealing with mostly video platforms at the moment. Um, and so it's going to be a question of how do we bolt something on while we're trying. We don't know yet how hard or easy it's going to be. We know from high anxiety, it seemed easy, right? But I want to, you know, I always feel, and I, I'm an advisor to other startups, and I always ask people not to boil the ocean, you know, too much at the beginning. Um, so, um, but I do recognize that games are, I mean, Roblox, I mean, there are social games and things where girls are a big part of that world. Um, so I don't want to be exclusive about them. And we do tend to, we do plan to sort of visually 
borrow from the game world in some of the some of the first pilots I want to do. I don't want them all to be just live action. You know, I come from cartoons, and I also think there's going to be room for sort of that kind of game like graphic thing when there's um, when they're having, instead of maybe having to shoot three different outcomes, it becomes like a different state of mind, and we can use graphic and game type things. Um, as a way of depicting something coming out of the thinking of maybe a live action character. So we're going to be blending things from the game world in, um, but it's a point well made and well taken. And um, I just, the reason I mentioned with boys is that uh, girls love narrative and games and boys just seem to be big gamers uh, much more so. And, um, and uh, girls are more the bigger users of social media as well. Um, and so, uh, Gabby, uh, thanks you for the uh, answer, and thank you, Gabby, for the question. Um, I want to mention that St Steve Mazur is the reason why uh, Betty has been uh, in embraced and welcomed into the Family Office Insights community, so I want to just give him a, a high five over Zoom here. Thank you. It's all his fault. Um, <laughs> I'm thanking him, too. The uh, uh, Our friend Holly Carter says, or, uh, can the platform be useful in the school system? And if so, how? Is the social emotional teaching taking root effectively in public school? And she says, hello, Art and Betty. <laughs> Those sound like Holly questions. Hi, Holly. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, we don't, we are starting this as a consumer um, effort but uh, I didn't. I didn't get into the details of it. But there, I think, is going to be an opportunity to because the schools are a big source of, you know, they're getting. As we said, they're spending a lot of money and they're getting a lot of funding. And whether the things they're going to spend their money on are going to be as engaging as our stuff remains to be seen. So I actually do think there's opportunity. The whole thing of gearing up to sell to schools is like another. Um, uh, another activity, but with the right licensing partner or distribution partner, it's something we would consider um, because I think there's going to be demand for it. I think uh, our, you know, if we're trying to, we're dealing with a very um, competitive uh, bandwidth of, you know, the consumer market. Uh, and so if we can get the hearts and minds of girls there, imagine how useful it could be for school. I always just, um, so I'm not ignoring them. I'm just, again, starting with the consumer market um, because, uh, because that's where, you know, as I said in the pet presentation, it's not just in school where this needs to be learned. Um, and, uh, but I actually am not school adverse if we can uh, stay focused on becoming more of an iconic you know, culture shifting media thing and schools want it and we can figure out how to get it to them. Um, and I know Holly knows a fair amount about alternative distribution to schools from her own work. Uh, so that's definitely uh, on the table. In terms of being a platform for schools, we're gonna be on social media. So to the degree to which uh, schools allow their kids to, or, you know, if the teachers want to bring things in, I mean, their teachers probably use YouTube and things all the time in their classrooms. So, um, it's more going to be a question of uh, as we get into, uh, uh, you know, the learning part. And we actually might want to do some work with schools, or certainly more of some, the, some of the educators on my team. Uh, we, we have to figure. We I don't know if you saw on the timeline. We're going to spend probably the first two years just playing around with different forms of assessment, and that's where the SEL experts come in. Is how do we actually set goals for our shows to figure out what is measurable. And then how meaningful, you know, how does that measurement, we didn't even know when we did high anxiety that we were going to be getting these kind of posts where girls were saying, hey, they, hey, Latin, we did know enough because we were SEL guided in shooting uh, the video with Lana Connor to, uh, um, to, um, to not just have her talk, but to have her physically demonstrate her box breathing. Lana Condor, by the way, I mispronounced her name. But when somebody demonstrated something, You'd think, well, that's kind of obvious, but that's, you know, that's how we could tell that the girls had learned something because they were saying they saw it and they're practicing it. That's really lightweight, you know, assessment, but uh, we start there and then we're going to be going to all sorts of, you know, how do you build the story uh, and the, you know, the choices, should I stay or should I go? Uh, that's already a feature on Instagram that people probably use as influencers asking, should I wear red lipstick or pink, <laughs> purple lipstick? It could be put to better use and it shows, to, it shows the voter instantly, not 
um, exactly who voted, but like whether their vote was more or less common than others. A key thing that's going to be interesting for teaching SEL and the, on the point of assessment is that uh, all the SEL experts I've talked to have said, you know, these are teenagers. What would be really cool in some of those things where they have to make choices is to not have it be a, a specifically, you know, black or white, right or wrong, that actually the shades of gray you know, offering choices where it's not clear where, which one's the right answer, because life is kind of that way. Um, it can be a lot more engaging and also um, generates a lot more conversation uh, in posts or, you know, wherever we're going to be holding the conversations. If it's not necessarily this is right and this is wrong, but sort of how do you weigh things? And they have them contribute to the story. Yes. Yes, and that's actually what we we're trying to show with the, the Instagram show. And it's like, should I do this or should I do that? Is that uh, our production for that show is going to be quite interesting. And I really want to get funded for something of that ilk because we're going to be innovating how you have a social media team uh, working tightly with the, the writers and producers of like, okay, it looks like looks like we're the next episode that she might want to actually have left, <laughs> you know, because most people voted for that. Um, and so... Uh, uh, yes, this, the, the ability to influence outcomes might be one of the different things we do, um, but we don't, we're not starting out with some sort of, um, you know, laid in stone framework for every show. That's what this whole first year is about. And probably some of the shows in the second year is to, to have this team kind of go, okay, what is it we're going to teach? What are the interesting stories that people want to tell? And what's the right way of matching, you know, um, the mechanics of the story with a way of measuring uh, some form of there's awareness and then there's also behavior change and those are two different types of out, you know two different types of measurements right there. Yeah, totally makes sense. So um, uh, to the audience, if there's anybody in your world that you uh, would care to make sure they're in touch with Betty, please feel free if for. You know, the purpose of this is that you're raising money for the early round here. And so um, the uh, activity post webinar uh, hopefully will be around the conversation with Betty about doing that sort of thing. So if there's anybody in your respective networks that should hear the story, please feel free to connect with Betty and connect them accordingly. And then I also wanted to shout out to Holly, who we apparently both know, um, who uh, I met the, she catalyzed my meeting the King of Tibet many, many years ago. So I just wanted to say thank you for that again. It was pretty amazing. And I want to thank Holly for her great question and for all that she's doing for kids and social studies with her work. Yeah. Uh, so we have to wrap it up. Um, please, uh, uh, Betty, you want to just have a short uh, closing remarks and then uh, we'll We'll move on. Okay. Well, uh, thank you all. I, I um, appreciate the questions. Um, the raise is a million dollars that we're going after right now. Um, my strong preference, uh, whose isn't, um, is this fewer larger uh, investments. We're trying to avoid, um, while I'm trying to build the company, having to deal with lots and lots of small ones. And so I, I actually am working with some broker dealers and others to uh, who are in touch with uh, there are sets of family offices as well as you guys and uh, uh, going after um, larger checks, but um, just trying to raise the first million at this point. So Excellent. Well done, Betty. Thank you for, that was extraordinary, actually. Thank you. You really went through it well. And, and Betty is correct. I noticed right from the very beginning how methodical and planning, and as you all know, I'm not. So I <laughs> Um, uh, thank you, Betty. Thank you for Family Office Insights community for being here once again and joining us. Um, and uh, we look forward to see you uh, uh, again next time. And as I always say, thank you for sharing with us the only thing you can't make more of, and that's your time. Till next time. Thank you, Betty. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>